So welcome everybody. Um, thanks for the interest. Uh, as you saw from the introduction, using these systems is pretty complicated. And we've tried to automate a bunch of examples that you can try out. And the whole goal of the workshop is for you to, to be able to uh, work on this with your own codes. And so hopefully by looking at our automated examples, you'll get a sense of, of how, to, um, how to do that. So the, uh, the detailed presentations are gonna be given by Lexano Adianto, uh, one of my staff members and, and Karen Joe. And so before they get a chance to talk, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our overall project and what we're trying to do. And once you see some of the complexity, you'll understand that uh, there's some, well, there's some issues. And so what we have is, uh, is a work in progress here, but uh, hopefully you'll be able to use it productively with your codes. So um, let me first uh, start with a brief acknowledgement. So as Helen mentioned, our uh, funding is mostly through the Exascale Computing Project. We also have some funding from Argonne, from the DOE Trilabs, AMD, and Total. The team that's working on HPC Toolkit is principally my group at, at Rice. There's a collection of research staff and uh, PhD students. We also work closely with Bart Miller at the University of Wisconsin, who works on the, who's the lead of the Dynans project. So the people that are here to help with the workshop are uh, the first row is my staff, Alexandro Arianto, Mark Crantel, myself, and Jiaju Meng. And then the bottom row is my PhD students, Aaron Cherian, uh, Dayan Grubisic, Yumeng Liu, and Karen Zhou. So um, as you're all aware, the, the DOE's plan for Exascale is uh, heterogeneous platforms. And so the Aurora Frontier and El Capitan are the, the forthcoming Exascale systems. Those are all um, GPU accelerated. Aurora has Intel GPU or will have Intel GPUs and Frontier and El Capitan will have AMD GPUs. And so that's been um, a major focus of our work. However, um, in this workshop, we're gonna be working on um, NVIDIA based heterogeneous supercomputers. So we've been working on the Intel, AMD and NVIDIA platforms um, all together. And so uh, there's Summit Sierra and uh, the forthcoming Perlmutter. And so today you'll get a chance to use Cori GPU and Summit. So for these uh, forthcoming exascale systems, there's a collection of node level programming models. And so what we're trying to capture with our tools are um, programming models that are that are using any of these uh, any of these techniques. So there's uh, Intel DPC++ for um, Intel's GPUs, there's CUDA for uh, NVIDIA GPUs, there's HIP for AMD GPUs, there's OpenACC and OpenMP, and then there's also template-based programming models that have been developed at the national labs, uh, Raja at Livermore and Cocos at Sandia. And so all of these are viable um, strategies for doing GPU programming at the node level, and our tool supports all of them. So, um, for global programming models, most people are using MPI, but there's also a collection of other global programming models. There's UPC++ that's been developed at, uh, at LBL, the GasNet um, global address space um, layer. It's a, it's a library-based model for uh, shared address space programming. Um, and so that and OpenSchmem are also viable options for, for, uh, for global um, sharing. And there's also the Charm++ model that was developed at UIUC. And so HPC Toolkit should also work with all of these as well. We're agnostic to the node level programming model and to the, uh, and to the global programming model. So there are a number of performance analysis challenges for GPU accelerated supercomputers. You, uh, you worry about the, the computation. So you need extreme scale data parallelism to keep your GPUs busy. You're worried about the data movement costs uh, within um, your, your nodes and between uh, memory spaces, between the CPU and the GPU. There's communication costs between the nodes and there's IO as well. And so with HPC Toolkit, our aim is to enable you to measure all of these things. So there's lots of ways you can hurt your performance. You can have insufficient parallelism or load imbalance or serialization, replicated work, data copy, synchronization, bad locality, 
and and so with HPC toolkit, you should be able to identify um, these kinds of problems with uh, with codes using each of those kinds of programming models. So the uh, the hardware and execution models are uh, pretty complex. So we've got uh, the CPU and GPU compute engines that have vastly different characteristics, capabilities, and performance concerns. There's multiple memory spaces, the CPU um, memory and the GPU memory that have different characteristics. And then we also have some asynchronous execution if you're launching um, asynchronous kernels on the GPU. So all this is a, is a pretty significant challenge for tools to be able to gain some insight into that. And so our tools have to um, interpose themselves in a layer between the operating system and your application and then monitor everything that's that's going on as your code interacts with the device. So some measurement related challenges. Um, well, if you're using extreme scale parallelism, then any serialization within our tools is going to disrupt parallel performance. And so our tools uh, have a, a collection of concurrent data structures inside them so that uh, we won't hurt your, your application performance. When we're measuring performance, we're very dependent upon third-party measurement interfaces. And so if, uh, if we're gonna measure it, we have to measure it because there's hardware support or there's software support. And so on the hardware side, on the CPUs, there's a performance monitoring unit that can measure all sorts of things like instructions and cycles and cache misses and uh, instruction completion and things like that. On the software side, we're dependent upon a number of different interfaces that enable us to see how your application interacts with the uh, both the operating system and with the hardware. And so the in glibc, there's this capability called LD Audit that enables us to track dynamic loading of shared libraries. Um, it's, uh, it's really a great design. However, it turns out that it's only been lightly used. And so we've been working very closely with Red Hat to, uh, to address some bugs that we've discovered. And so um, I, all I can say is that it'll work better in the future once some of the bugs get cleaned out in, in glibc. So um, on Linux, there's the PerfEvent subsystem for, um, for measuring um, hardware performance but we can also actually measure performance in the kernel as well. Now, as it turns out, the systems that Cori and Summit are both configured in a way that you can't actually measure things in the kernel, but on other clusters or you know, machine back at your institution, uh, that's probably different, or you can get it configured differently. For GPU monitoring, we're using instrumentation libraries from the vendors, we're using um, today, we're using CUPTI, the CUDA performance tools interface from NVIDIA. There's uh, a, a rock tracer library from AMD, and there's some, some uh, instrumentation libraries from Intel that we use as well. So to measure your parallel applications running on CPU and GPU, there's a couple of different measurement strategies that we're using. We're using sampling on the CPU. We're periodically interrupting the, the application and uh, identifying where uh, costs are incurred. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Um, for GPU operations, we get callbacks when GPU operations are launched, and sometimes we get callbacks when they're completed. For GPUs, we're also using an event stream that uh, tells us that uh, a particular kernel started at time T and finished at time T prime. Um, on NVIDIA GPUs, we also get uh, PC sampling measurements, and so we can find out uh, what machine instructions it uh, spent its time in and if there are any delays, what those delays are. So another challenge for our tools for, for the measurement side is that GPU kernels are very frequently launched. And so in order to uh, not add a lot of overhead to your code, we had to work on tuning our, uh, our, our tools so that uh, we can measure when kernels are launched and, and attribute those costs to the program context and do that quickly. So there's a number of engineering challenges for performance tools. And I don't wanna dwell on this um, a lot. I just wanna say it's very complicated on, uh, especially on these supercomputers. And so um, applications have, uh, we've seen as many as a hundred shared libraries, applications that are larger than five gigabytes um, with features where exit is initiated by a non-initial thread or they fork non-readable helper applications. Um, dynamic libraries are loaded all the time. And there's um, 
things like threads being created in the NIT constructors and libraries, processes fork, um, when processes fork, these interact with the tooling substrates. And so let's just say that there's a, there's a, a lot of complexity in there. So all this is to say that for your application, you may run into a problem with some of these things. Um, we've been working with a lot of complex applications. And so we, we think we're on the right track. If you run into a problem, then just let us know and we'll take a look at it and see if we need to make any adjustments. So compared to other GPU performance tools, um, other GPU performance tools feature a, a trace view that shows a series of events that happen over time in each process thread and, and GPU stream. There's also a profile view of uh, GPU kernels that shows some performance metrics with, uh, with uh, program contexts. But um, there are a collection of tools. So for NVIDIA's tools, there's Insight Systems, Insight Compute, MVProf, and then for uh, AMD systems, there's Rock Profiler and Intel's VTune. And there's some third-party tools such as uh, Tau. Now, how ours are how our tools differ from these? These other tools lack a comprehensive profile view to analyze complex CPU calling text and calling context, including inline frames where GPU operations are invoked. You want to understand where, how, and why GPU kernels arose from instantiating nested templates. And so that's particularly the case with these template-based programming models like Raj and Cocos. And you want to understand the, the cost of uh, GPU APIs, for example, CUDA memcopy that are invoked from many different contexts in your program. And you need, to, you need to understand where those costs are incurred, not just my program spends a lot of time copying data. You'd like to know where the copies are expensive and then um, take some steps to, uh, to reduce the cost by moving the data on and then running many kernels while the data is on the GPU and then, and then moving the data off instead of moving the data back and forth at every kernel launch, for instance. Um, there's also sophisticated calling context on the GPU. So using OpenMP Target or Cocos or Raja, you can end up with GPU code that has uh, a lot of different procedures. And so um, just knowing that I spent time in my kernel isn't necessarily enough for uh, this uh, Livermore code uh, called Mercury, they have about 100,000 lines of code that runs in a GPU kernel. And so if you're just told that your kernel is slow, that doesn't really help tune your application. And so we collect fine grain information inside the GPU kernels and we can actually recover calling contexts within the GPU. So if there's multiple functions on the GPU, we can, we can attribute it to the individual functions and show how those, uh, those functions are invoked. And you'll see more of that in a bit. So um, we can also collect and attribute loop level performance information on both CPUs and GPUs. As far as I know, nobody does this on GPUs and I don't think anyone does this on CPUs either, at, at least without adding uh, loop level instrumentation, which is, is very expensive. So um, at best, the existing tools really only attribute like a flat runtime cost to a, a, a flat profile of functions executing on the GPUs. And we do a lot more than that. So let me give you a an introduction to um, HPC Toolkit's performance tools. Um, I'll give you an overview of their the components and their workflow, and then briefly mention HPC Toolkit's graphical user interfaces. And then my colleague, Lexano Adianto, will follow up with um, a talk in detail about how to get the most out of our graphical user interfaces when analyzing your application. And then, um, the second topic I'll talk about is uh, analyzing performance of GPU accelerated applications um, with HPC Toolkit. I'll give you an overview of our measurement capabilities and how we collect the data and analyze, anal analyze it and attribute it. And, uh, and then finally, I'll finish with a, a few closing remarks and then we can move on to the, the detailed presentations by um, Laxano and Karen on how to actually use our tools on your codes. So um, for a long time, uh, HPC Toolkit has been doing um, binary level measurement and analysis. So we're observing executions of fully optimized dynamically linked parallel applications, and we can support multiple languages as long as you have um, compiled code, um, not, um, not necessarily jitted code like Java. And we can also accommodate the fact that uh, your application is typically using a collection of, of libraries that are only available in binary form.
So we use uh, sampling to collect measurements on the CPU. The reason for this is that it has controllable overhead. Also, um, if we we're adding instrumentation to your code, we might just measure your program and not measure the time you spend in any, uh, any libraries that are loaded. So by using sampling, we measure where you are no matter what you're in. So the, the key difference here um, that we're focused on today is measuring GPU performance. So when we measure GPU performance, we're typically using vendor APIs. And so um, that's a blessing because it's, it's a level of abstraction that we get to rely on. It's a curse because the level of abstraction that the vendors are providing, well, it doesn't have all the features we want and uh, we've encountered a lot of bugs. So in using these vendor APIs, we register callbacks to monitor the launch and completion of GPU operations. And then we also measure uh, asynchronous GPU operations using these uh, things called activity APIs that uh, NVIDIA and AMD apply that provide an event stream that says this function ran and, and it had the following characteristics and it ran from time T to T prime. Also on um, NVIDIA GPUs, we're collecting fine grain measurements using PC sampling. So this is something that's supported by the hardware um, since uh, AMD, uh, sorry, since NVIDIA's Maxwell GPU. So in fact, um, back in 2013, we got uh, deeply involved with NVIDIA and told them that uh, their measurement strategy wasn't good enough and that we wanted some more detailed measurement support. I had some discussions with, uh, with NVIDIA about adding some support for PC sampling and then um, they got around to it and added it in Maxwell. And so we were very pleased. And so that actually provides some, some deep insight into what's going on and you'll get a chance to use that today. On uh, Intel GPUs, we're actually using instrumentation. We're using binary instrumentation to collect measurements on, on GPUs. So those are two strategies for fine grain measurement. For AMD, there isn't a strategy for fine grain measurement yet. Um, so our, our tool associates metrics with both uh, static context. So static context being like load modules and files and functions and loop nests and dynamic contexts are call chains. And so we get to do this where we're associating performance with loop nest procedures, inline code and calling context, both on the CPU and the GPU. So we're actually building heterogeneous call chains that go from the CPU all the way into your GPU code. So um, the user interface, as Laksana will show you, has, uh, has a mechanism for um, computing derived metrics. And so you can compute your own derived metrics on the CPU and GPU to uh, obtain insights. So you can write some, some metrics that uh, look like waste or scalability loss or, uh, or say to compute uh, cash miss ratios, things like that um, from the raw data that you collect. And then um, our tools support top-down performance analysis and, and you'll see that more with uh, the user interfaces with Lexano. So let me just give, give you a high level overview of how HPC Toolkit works. And so the situation is a little bit more complicated for GPUs, but not too much. So Karen has a, a more detailed diagram in his talk. So you start out by um, compiling your application and linking it the way that you normally do. So um, we don't really need you to change your make files at, at all um, if, you're, if you're building dynamic binaries. So um, in her talk, uh, Helen mentioned to use the dash fast option. So that actually isn't something that we tested when we put together the examples for, um, for Corey. Um, what we found in the past is that dash fast will actually change whether you're generating a dynamic binary or a, a static binary. And so um, the examples that we're providing are uh, using uh, HPC run for measurement. And so for that, we're expecting dynamic binaries. If uh, you're actually producing static binaries, there are way, there's a way to measure those too. We have a, a tool called HPC link that'll link our measurement code into your application. And so if, uh, if you're generating static binaries, then there's some details in our manual on um, how to use HPC link to add instrumentation. So for dynamic binaries, what what you do is you just take the binary that was uh, that you compiled and you profile it by using our HPC run command. Um, so you launch your application using HPC run. And 
it will collect um, call path profiles of the events of interest, and it will also collect call path traces. And you'll see a little bit more about those in just a second. And then um, where necessary, it's going to intercept interfaces for control and measurement. So for instance, uh, we wanna know when threads are created and when threads are destroyed and when the process exits. And so um, we have a little bit of instrumentation at those points in order to maintain control of your application. Um, so what do I mean by call path profiles? Well, what call path profiling does is we're uh, attributing costs to um, the calling context in which the costs are incurred. And so on the CPU, we're sampling um, using Linux timers or we're using hardware counters. And so the hardware counters can be used to count things like cache misses. And so we can say, interrupt me every time you execute a, a, a million cache misses. Or uh, we can say, uh, interrupt me with a timer every time, uh, every every time you hit a thousandth of a second, for instance. And so, what what happens is when we get when when um, either a timer goes off or a hardware counter overflows, it interrupts the application and the tool takes control, um, fielding the profiling signal. And we find out that we're at a particular machine instruction. So we're at some some instruction in some routine. Uh, C, and then we unwind to find we unwind the, the call chain to find that that we were in C when called from B, when called from A, when called from main, and so that is a so-called call path sample, where we're attributing the costs of of either the timer expiration or the hardware counter overflow to a particular instruction in a particular context, and so. Um, we gather CPU calling contexts for GPUs um, using, sorry, we gather CPU contexts using stack unwinding. And um, when, we're, um, when we're launching GPU kernels, we, we unwind the call stack to find out where we are when we launch the GPU kernel. And so this is how we, we gather the information for a single call path. And then over time, as the application executes, we're building a tree. So conceptually, you can think of, of there being a node at the top of the tree that kind of corresponds to main, and then some subtree might correspond to a solver, another subtree might correspond to initialization, another subtree might correspond to post-processing. And so the result of our measurements is that we have a tree with weights, where the weights correspond to whatever metrics we're measuring. So whether it's uh, time or cache misses, we're attributing those costs in context. The nice thing about using um, sampling on the CPU to gather this is that our, our measurement cost is proportional to the sampling frequency and not the frequency with which functions are called. And so anybody that's using instrumentation as their principal measurement mechanism where every time you enter or leave a procedure, then you're invoking a tool, then that can add a lot more overhead. And so by adjusting the sampling frequency, you can adjust your measurement cost with HPC Toolkit. If you think it's too costly, then you you can uh, just lower the sampling frequency and uh, reduce your measurement cost. So the second thing that we do is we analyze your application binaries. So we have a tool called HPC struct. And so this will um, take your application binary and recover program structure information. And so this will give the most detailed information and attribute performance to individual source lines when you've compiled and you've added a, a, a like dash G like option. So you can compile with optimization turned on, and then you can either use dash G or with the PGI compilers, you use dash G opt, which basically says record line map information, but don't disturb optimization. So what the HPC struct tool does is it analyzes the, the machine code that the compiler generated. It looks at the line map information that was recorded by the compiler, and it looks at, at debugging information. So for instance, uh, information about inlining that was recorded by the compiler. It extracts um, loop nests. So by analyzing the machine code, we're actually uh, recovering loop nests and, and control flow in your application. We identify inline procedures, and then it maps uh, uh, the, uh, the structure of the control flow that um, is in your application binary. It maps it back to what it was in the original source code. And we know what uh, if, if there's something like uh, code that's been hoisted out of a loop, we can tell that because we can tell um, where uh, 
by looking at the line information, we can tell that uh, code that is both inside and outside a loop came from the same place. So this, uh, this binary analysis computes program structure information. It tells us about the, the files in a, a load module, either being your program or a shared library. So we know the, the load module, we know the files, we know the procedures, we know the loop nests in the procedure, the statements in the procedure, and inline code. So we first collect our, our measurements, which is attributing um, costs to addresses in machine code. Then we compute the program structure information, which tells us how the machine code relates to the application source code. And then um, we use a, so the, the binary analysis is, is done using um, this library called Dynast, which is a, a toolkit from the University of Wisconsin. And so we're using um, their, uh, their parse API for parsing the machine code, uh, SimTab API for analyzing the, uh, the symbol table information and line maps in it, instruction API and the data flow API for doing instruction level analysis and, uh, and slicing. And so Dynast uh, provides us, uh, there's some native support for um, analyzing AMD GPU binaries and there's some lightweight support that uh, enables us to, it does enough so that we can actually analyze GPU binaries for NVIDIA GPUs and for Intel GPUs. So the next thing that we do after um, collecting the measurements with HPC run and then analyzing your, your uh, CPU and GPU binaries with HPC struct, then um, we have a tool called HPC prof for combining the, uh, the information from the program structure file and the call path profiles. There's also another tool called HPC prof MPI. And so um, this is not just for analyzing MPI programs. This is for analyzing small scale data. This itself is an MPI program and we use it for analyzing large scale performance data. And so rather than analyzing your performance data sequentially on, your, on a head node, you can launch a parallel job to analyze um, lots of performance data. So for instance, if uh, you had a, a job that had maybe a thousand MPI ranks or something, rather than serially analyzing all the profiles from those thousand MPI ranks, you can use HPC Prof MPI to uh, analyze those in parallel. So the result of our analysis is what we call a database. It's a directory full of, of information about uh, the profiles and the, and the traces related back to the source code. And then we have a presentation tool called uh, HPC Viewer. And so this enables you to explore the performance data from multiple perspectives. You can rank order um, your inspection. You can rank order the, the cost by particular metrics. So if you wanna focus on cycles or instructions or GPU instruction counts or GPU stalls, you can just say, okay, I wanna put it in this sorting order, sorted order, and then show me where those costs occur. You can also compute derived metrics in the viewer interface as Lexon will show you. And then with, um, with our trace analyzer that's, that's in here, we can explore the execution behavior over time. So um, this is what our, uh, our user interface looks like. And so Lexon is gonna tell you a lot more about it, but I just wanna point out a few things. So there's a, a, a source pane that has some source code in it. There's a navigation pane, which is going to show you um, either uh, top-down call chains or bottom-up call chains, Lexon will explain the difference, or um, flat, a flat view that shows you like the load modules and files and functions and, and loop nests uh, where your application spent code. And then there's some, some metrics and the metrics are whatever you, you collected. And so here, this was done with just measuring using time-based metrics. So um, the other thing that's important is that there's uh, support for uh, looking at three different views, a top down, a bottom up and a flat view. So there's some view control tabs. There's also some tabs over here that control the metric display. Lexana will tell you more about those. The thing that I wanted to point out um, about this. So this is a top down view. And what this is showing you is the view of, of like a call chain in the code. And you notice that in blue, um, their names of procedures. In the green, there's names of procedures that are, are preceded by I in brackets. This means that this code has been inlined and that we were able to discover that the code was inlined and we're able to attribute it back to um, the, uh, the, the source code in the application. So we have 
um, a procedure. We have loop nest in that procedure. We've got a chain of inline functions. We have another procedure, another chain of inline functions, some inline templates, a loop, some more inline templates, an outlined open MP loop, and then finally um, Lambda functions that are invoked by um, these uh, Raja template based programming models. So this is Raja sitting on top of OpenMP. And what we're able to do is to reconstruct this uh, complicated um, context in which your, uh, your costs are incurred. And so the thing that's nice about this is that while the while when we're using call stack unwinding at runtime, what we're measuring is the call chain. So the real procedures are there's main and there's cal volume force for elms, and then there's uh, an outline um, open MP routine. All of these other layers with the loops and the inline code, that all comes, um, that doesn't cost us anything to gather at measurement time. That all comes from, from combining our measurement data with um, the, the program structure information where we identify where all the inline code and loops are. And so that comes at, at no extra cost when you're measuring your program. So to understand um, the temporal behavior of an application. So at, I, I mentioned earlier that we'll get interrupted and then we'll unwind the call chain. And so over time for an individual thread, we may unwind in different places and we may may see call chains that differ to some extent over time. So maybe the top level of the call chain may represent main, and then this, uh, these, this green may represent some procedure called solve, and maybe it does um, um, a, some sort of preconditioning step followed by, um, followed by some um, main solve. And, and so these call chains represent the individual context that we ran over time. By actually keeping all of the call chains um, individually, then what we can do is look at all of the different places where a thread was in over time. And then we can do this for each of the threads and, and MPI ranks. And so then we, we view this by um, conceptually, there's a visibility plane. And if you lift it all the way up to the top, you'll see that everybody was in main for the entire time in the execution. And then you move down and you look at it at, at a, um, a lower level of abstraction, you might see that there's some sort of initialization phase, a solve phase, and a post-processing phase. And then you look a little bit lower, and then you start to see detail inside the initialization phase, inside the solve phase, et cetera. And so you'll see this more when Lexano gives um, a demo. So here is just like one static um, screenshot from our, our viewer to just give you a sense of what's going on. So this is actually for a, a code called Flash that was developed at the University of Chicago. So it uh, uses block structured AMR and uh, they, they simulate astrophysical flashes. And so this particular execution was from a, uh, a detonation of a, a white dwarf star. And so when you write your, your program in MPI, generally you're thinking it's an SPMD programming model. Every, everybody's doing the same thing all the time. Now, what, what we have here is we have ranks and threads on the vertical axis and then time on the horizontal axis. And so what we find is that looking across the ranks and threads, we see actually that, that different, um, different ranks um, are executing different amounts of work. So this pink represents some particular action inside the application, like it might correspond to uh, setting up, um, setting up some, some uh, like pre-processing some mesh or something. And, and so what we find is that on some of the ranks, it takes longer than on others. And so while your, your conceptual view is that everybody's doing the same thing, what you find is that they're, they spend different amounts of time doing it. And then this uh, blue in here is, is, uh, is some of them, they're waiting on like a collective communication that occurs after, after this phase. And so with this um, view across uh, ranks and threads and over time, you can see variations that give you some understanding of of load balance or load imbalance or serialization that enables you to tune your program. Now, at, um, in, in this view, there's a, a cursor and that shows uh, where we are. And then for that, we have an individual call chain. And, um, and so this tells you the complete call chain at that particular point in time at that, for that um, MPI rank. You might think it's gotta be very expensive to collect all this information. Actually, every sample is only 12 bytes. It's uh, an eight byte timestamp and a four byte 
identifier for a node in a tree. And then by, by taking the node in the tree and unwinding um, up to the top, like every node has a path up to the root. And so by just identifying the node, then we know the complete path. And so we're able to just kind of gather this information for, for free. And that's interposed on, um, on the, the data that we gather at runtime. Like so, I'll tell you a lot more about um, the trace viewer and using it. So now let's get into our support for performance analysis of GPU accelerated applications. So um, I mentioned that we have, uh, HPC Toolkit has a, a core for measuring GPU accelerated applications. And um, on top of that core sits uh, measurement interfaces for um, NVIDIA GPUs, AMD GPUs, Intel GPUs, and then um, there's a, an OpenMP layer and OpenCL layer that are sort of independent of the individual GPUs. So in this talk, we're going to focus on um, the support for NVIDIA GPUs. And so we're principally using um, this NVIDIA layer or a, an NVIDIA layer inside HPC Toolkit that is leveraging um, NVIDIA's CUPD user interface. And so CUPD is, uh, is NVIDIA's uh, performance tools interface that gathers all the information about uh, the GPU performance. So some highlights of, of HPC Toolkit support for GPU accelerated codes. We unwind the call stack to identify the CPU calling context for every time you invoke a GPU API. So we can tell where your kernels were launched, where your copies were incurred, and we map all that back to these uh, calling context profiles. And we're able to show you that. Um, and you'll see examples of this later. So internally, HPC Toolkit is employing some novel data structures for uh, fast and non-blocking inter-thread coordination. We've got um, the application threads are launching things. The, uh, there's a, a GPU monitoring thread that is uh, gathering data off the GPU. And then we have to take that measurement data and attribute it back to the application threads. And so it's important that we have fast data structures for doing this because we don't want to disturb the execution of your application. Um, so HPC Toolkit has support for binary analysis of GPU code to attribute fine-grained performance measurements. So for NVIDIA GPUs, the fine-grained performance measurements are in the form of PC samples. And so we can do this for NVIDIA, Intel, and AMD GPU binaries. We uh, use a novel technique to reconstruct an approximate um, GPU calling context tree to attribute the costs to functions on the GPU. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Um, in a single run, we can gather a rich set of metrics that we that we derive from the PC sampling measurements that can give you some insight into your GPU performance. And then um, we have a, a new version that is performing scalable analysis of sparse representations of performance measurements. And this is this is actually sort of a coming attraction. It's in a branch, but it's not in the versions that are installed on on Cori and Summit at the moment. So so what are we doing at runtime? So as a program runs, I showed you these calling context trees earlier. And so here we have some, some um, a, a couple of nodes in a calling context tree. And so this might be like main calls, some function um, solve, which then launches a kernel on the GPU. And so we have CPU calling context, we have GPU kernels, and then inside the GPU kernels, we have GPU machine instructions. And so when we measure something that's running on one of these heterogeneous supercomputers, we may be measuring things like time on the CPU. We, we measure um, how much time we're spending in each of the functions here. We're doing this using sampling. And then for a kernel, we have um, information at the kernel level about how many registers you're using and the time that was spent in the kernel. We also have information about uh, the sampling frequency and whatnot. And so there's a, a collection of kernel level information. And then for each of the machine instructions inside the kernel, we have some detailed information like instruction stalls and we can find out like, what's the total number of instruction stalls. So like how much time are we, do we spend running? How much time do we spend stalled? And how much of those stalls are waiting for memory and how much of those stalls are due to synchronization um, or um, waiting for values from functional units. So there's a lot of detailed information we can measure using NVIDIA's PC sampling. So what we get out of this is we get um, these code centric profiles of GPU accelerated code. And so here we're showing a calling context that has on top, we have the, on the CPU and then inside uh, a GPU kernel, 
we have some contexts that involve loops and inline code. And so we have fine grain metrics like number of instructions executed. We have coarse grain metrics like seconds that we spent executing a kernel. And so the kernel metrics um, just apply to the kernel, whereas the fine grain metrics apply inside the kernel itself. And then we have derived metrics like GPU utilization. Okay, so there's sort of three different things we can get. We have fine grain metrics, coarse grain metrics, and derived metrics for GPU kernels. So when we're measuring GPU performance at runtime, there's three categories of threads. There's application threads, there's a monitoring thread, there's generally one per process that's getting the information that's streaming off the GPU. And, in, and internally, there's some, um, some tracing threads that are used by our tool to gather traces for the, the GPU execution streams. You may ask, why am I telling you this? This is, you know, this seems a lot like internal detail inside our tool. Why do you care? Well, if you're using a, a job launcher like JS Run that's like very carefully controlling how many cores you get and the mappings of, of things, um, we have some resources that we're using. We're using some, some threads inside our, um, our tool and you may need to provision some extra cores to, uh, to um, run our, our tool threads as well, okay? And so that's just a, 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 a cautionary tale. So I don't have any specific uh, advice to offer you other than that this probably needs to be considered. So a safe way is to sort of over provision your job, but there's probably a better way to do it. So the, the threads are interacting in various ways. So on an application thread, we're creating a correlation that says, uh, anytime I launch a GPU kernel, we, we know, we gather the calling context where the kernel was launched. Then um, we get information from, um, from the GPU and um, it's uh, associated with a particular correlation that was recorded. When we launched a kernel, we noted that there's a correlation ID um, on the, the, the thread that launches the kernel. And then the, the uh, the monitoring thread says, okay, I've got some, some uh, measurements that needed to be correlated with a particular calling context. And so these particular measurements belong to uh, thread one with a particular calling context. And so um, to attribute measurements, we're taking information from the GPU monitoring thread and we're feeding it back to one of the application threads. And then finally, we, we're uh, recording traces. And so the GPU monitoring thread is getting the information about um, what kernel executions occurred and what time intervals they occurred in. And then it's uh, handing them to some tracing threads that are actually writing this stuff in files as your application runs. So um, I don't wanna go into this in, in too much detail, but um, there's your, your application threads and we're monitoring um, the application threads with uh, some callbacks. So when uh, GPU operations get launched and completed, we get some callbacks. There's uh, some tracing threads that are responsible for recording traces into trace files. And then internally, we're monitoring um, the information about uh, what was launched where, and then we're, we're monitoring information back from the GPU that says, so here's what happened. And then we send the measurement data back to the application threads to say, record this, that you launched a kernel and it took so long and record that in your profile. And so that's what's happening under the hood. So, um, so one of the, the things that's, um, that's important for understanding GPU performance is that we compute an approximation of GPU calling context so you can better understand your application performance. So, the, so when you're using GPU code from like C++ template based programming models, it turns out that the GPU code is complex. And so with NVIDIA GPUs, I mentioned that we can collect these PC samples. We can find out where you spent your time executing instructions, but those don't give us any calling context information. That just says, um, I, was, I, I got sampled and I was at machine instruction 65 at the following address. And um, so what other tools do is they produce flat profiles. Now, when we have um, complex C++ applications, here's what a flat profile looks like. So this was from um, uh, a code called the Raja perf suite. So it's just measuring various Raja operations. And so what this was doing is it was launching a dot product operation. And then while executing the dot product operation, while executing optimized code for the dot product operation, we had 
all of these functions were, were uh, observed. And so there's a whole collection of things that um, were, were generated through the, the template uh, metaprogramming. And, um, and so you just see all of this and you say, well, how does that relate to a dot product? That's what these flat profiles look like. So in fact, for executing a dot product, there were 25 functions that execute on the GPU. And I would argue, this is not a good way to analyze your code. So what we did is HPC Toolkit reconstructs approximate GPU calling context. It, it, um, I'll, I'll talk about more about how it does that in, in just a minute. And let me just show you what the result is. And so for Raja, we see this is the CPU calling context and here it's launching a kernel. And then we compute this, um, we reconstruct this, this call chain on the GPU that shows that you're implementing a uh, CUDA for, uh, for all CUDA kernel and then um, a privatizer inside Raja. Then we can see that there's a dot operation, which is invoking reduce sum, which invokes a reduce template. And then there's some, some details. And finally, there's a, a loop down on the reduce template that's actually doing the work. And so what I would say is that that seeing this information in context, this looks a lot more like the conceptual model of your code than what you see if you just get these flat profiles that have 25 functions in there. And so we believe that that our approach for reconstructing these calling contexts and using binary analysis to, uh, to do that is actually pretty important for understanding um, these complicated codes that people are developing as part of uh, the DOE um, Exascale Computing Project. What's the difference between those two lines in that single box that had the same label? Loop at uh, PP203, why are there two? Oh, so this says that there's like, there's inline code from, from line 203. And it just says like, I've got some, some inline stuff and I can see that there's a bunch of code that came from line 203. And then we can see that on line 203, in fact, there, there are some, some nested loops. Okay, so then the nested loops provide context for the stuff that's really happening. So you'll get a chance to, to see this um, when, when you look at um, the PC sample profiles for some of the, the sample applications. So the, the one thing I wanna say at the moment is that um, NVIDIA doesn't have great um, dwarf information that um, is, that maps every machine instruction back to its full provenance where it came from. And so often we see there's a machine instruction and it came from the following source, uh, source line in a particular function, like it's in some function C. But what we really wanna know is that there was a call to A, then a call to B and a call to C, and then all of them got inlined. And so the code for C got mixed into B and mixed into A. And so um, in, CUDA 11.2, NVIDIA built some better line mapping information and we have not yet used that inside HPC Toolkit because it involves making some changes to the way line maps are analyzed, making some changes to the Diamond's binary analyzer. But um, hopefully the additional line mapping information that they provided will have us uh, able to compute better reconstructions of the of the inline code, okay? So that I think is a coming attraction. So here, it just says like, this is inline code that, that came from this file, but we don't know like what function it came from because we just don't have that information. Just we know that it came from somewhere. Whereas um, the new information that they're producing, it should look like um, that there's a call to an inline function on line 143, there's a call to this inline function. And then inside that inline function, on line 723, there's another call to another inline function. And so that's the level of detail that we expect to eventually get on the GPUs, okay? Does that answer your question, Steve? Yes, yes, thanks. Okay. More than answered it. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so one of the things that we do is we reconstruct these uh, call and context trees. And so the, the problem is that the GPU um, monitoring APIs don't collect call paths inside the GPU kernels. All we get are these flat PC samples. And, and so we might see some samples inside some function F and that function F might be invoked from different call sites. And so we need to decide how to attribute costs among each of those call sites. So 
the solution we have is we, we, can, we do a, a reconstruction of this GPU call and context tree using uh, the flat instruction samples. And then we also use uh, information about the static call chains that uh, we get from analyzing the binary. So let me tell you just a bit how this works so you, you have some understanding of what's, what's going on under the hood. So we analyze the GPU binary and we, can, and we look at, at uh, we, we figure out every function, we look at the other functions it calls. So maybe inside some function F, we can see that it calls function G and H. And so we build this uh, static call graph that says F calls G and H, and then maybe H calls I and J, okay? And so we have a collection of static call graphs. And then um, when we measure the application, we actually collect samples of, of call instructions that we can see that there's a call instruction um, inside F to function G and we measure that it occurred. And so now we know that G is actually, was actually called inside F at runtime. So we take our static call graph and then we initialize it with, um, with call counts that we get from either using sampling or if we're using instrumentation, we can use uh, instrumentation to, uh, to tell us how many times each of these calls was invoked. And then um, it may turn out that we're sampled inside some function G and we never got any calls to G, any call instructions that call G that were sampled. And so then based on the information that we have in the static call graph, we say, well, I know that I was, I know that I was in here. And then I look at, uh, at where I was called from. And so in this case, um, B2 is only called from one place. And so we say, I must have been called here. But if it was called from multiple places and we didn't see any of the calls, then we make an assumption that, well, I don't know where I was called. So let's just like, let's say that I was, will approximate and say, well, let me assume that each of my call sites reached me equally often. So then um, we, uh, I just talked about this. So the other thing that we do is where there might be uh, recursive or mutually recursive functions. And so um, we can't really uh, do a good job of, of figuring out who called who in this case, we just know that, that there was a bunch of calls between one and another and we can't tell who is the root and who is the, the leaf. So if we're just collecting samples and we find that some of the samples are in D and some of the samples are in E, but D calls E and E calls D, we just say fine. They're a strongly connected component. So that's a, a, a technique that refers to the, the fact that there are uh, cycles in the, the call graph. And so we compute all of the, after we compute the strongly connected components in the graph, then we say, okay, so for the strongly connected component, we see that there were costs that were incurred here and that we had some invocations from B and some invocations for C. And so then we take all the costs here and then we apportion them out and we say, okay, so there's two calls here and six calls there. So um, we end up with uh, two eighths and six eighths of the cost here. So what we're doing is we're making the assumption that for any time a function is invoked, we're making the assumption that all invocations have the same cost. So this is known as the GProf assumption. This is what the GProf profiling tool back in the, the 80s um, did for apportioning costs among callers. And so if we don't have any information about um, how much cost was incurred inside a particular function from a particular call site, we just make the assumption that, well, let's just assume that all calls are equal and then we'll apportion based on that. And so what we have is something where we know precisely where calls are, and then we're approximately attributing the cost among the calls based on the limited information that we have from sampling call instructions. So, um, so Karen will show you some examples of, of that later. Um, we also have some support for, um, for OpenMP uh, target operations. And so we can reconstruct the full calling context of, of call chains. And so here's an outline function inside OpenMP. And here it's launching uh, a kernel on the GPU. And so this, uh, this particular thing is, is, is uh, the particular call chain is reconstructed with the help of, of uh, a tooling interface um, that uh, we built inside the LLVM OpenMP runtime. And I'll say a little more about that later in, uh, in the second talk. 
So we can also reconstruct information um, with uh, from these template-based programming models and see that they offload kernels onto the GPUs and attribute those the cost of the GPU kernels back in the context where the templates ended up invoking um, things on the GPU. So finally, um, when we're collecting these measurements on the GPU, we measure um, using PC sampling. And it turns out that you can't measure using PC sampling and also uh, collect uh, other metrics. So NVIDIA's Insight Compute will run like nine passes over a kernel to collect multiple metrics. What we do is we use a single pass of measurements and then we compute some derived measurements from, from PC samples and other activity records to compute things like the utilization of the streaming multiprocessors and the GPU occupancy. And we do that using a single pass. And so that means that our, our measurement overhead is significantly lower. So here is, uh, is a sample execution trace of uh, this uh, Nix code that's developed as part of the ECP program. Um, I, as I recall, it's a cosmological code, but I don't remember the details. So what we had here was an execution that was running on Summit. And we have these uh, trace lines that are showing the activity on the, the GPUs. And so at this level, it looks rather cluttered. And so I'm just gonna zoom in on a little region in the execution. And now you can see that there's actually some, some structure. So we have some information about the CPU trace lines, and then we have uh, streams for each of the GPU streams that are running on the NVIDIA GPUs. So there's, uh, uh, streams on NVIDIA GPUs, there's uh, queues on um, AMD GPUs and on Intel GPUs that are the, that are the abstractions for where the, uh, the GPU costs um, are incurred. So um, what, while uh, tools like uh, in, in NVIDIA's, uh, NVIDIA has a, a trace-based interface that you can look at these uh, like individual trace lines for individual GPUs, we're trying to build with this tracing interface, we're trying to be able to look at uh, things across across an entire cluster and then be able to gather some statistics about that and look at how your program is using the cluster overall instead of just how you're using one GPU or using one stream in a GPU. So um, a coming attraction is that um, when we added support for measuring GPU executions, we're collecting a lot of GPU metrics. In some cases, it's 100 to 200 metrics, um, various kinds of uh, instruction stalls, various information about kernels, various information about data copies of, of, different, um, of different styles, whether it's uh, host to device, device to host, device to device, et cetera. And so the, the problem that we soon came up with was inside HPC Toolkit, originally, when we were collecting measurements for a CPU, we were using a small number of hardware performance counters maybe looking at cycles, instructions, and cache misses. Now we've got 200 metrics for um, GPU contexts. So for uh, GPU machine instruction, we have information about all of these instruction stalls. And so what we quickly found was that if we take, if, if we allocate space for all of these GPU measurements for every, for every point in one of these calling context trees, in fact, we have a whole lot of locations in the calling context tree that are on the CPU, that will have zeros for all of the GPU metrics. And so we end up with um, a large amount of data where most of it is zeros. And so we've, we've switched to collecting information in a sparse format. And now we have um, a, new, a new tool for uh, post-processing this and putting out our data in on sparse formats on disk. And so the sparsity really matters. When we were looking at um, Nix and LAMPS, Nix is this uh, astrophysical code and LAMPS is a molecular modeling code. We found that, um, that using a sparse data structures uh, reduced um, for Nix, reduced the, the space needed for collecting the measurements by 21 X. And then for LAMPS um, using a sparse representation of the, uh, of the result data from the results of our performance analysis gave us a 337 reduction in space. So if you're using, if you're using a very large scale code and you're running it at large scales, you may find that the, the data footprint for HPC Toolkit is quite, quite large when, uh, when you're collecting GPU measurements. And so I just wanted to offer this as, as, uh, as an indication that things are changing and that within the next couple of months, 
we expect to commit this uh, this uh, support for the sparse representations that will have a dramatic reduction in both the size of the measured data and size of the analysis results. So um, we use our tools ourselves for for looking at our our own execution performance, and so um, this is actually a uh, a a trace of our own. Um, HPC prof um, analysis tool. And so we collected 64K profiles for um, AMG 2006. This is a DOE benchmark for, uh, for algebraic multigrid. And so we ran, this is not a GPU accelerator, but we ran this on, on theta. And so we collected traces for, um, for 64K um, ranks and threads. And so using um, HPC prof MPI, we, we did the analysis on 8K and L nodes and in, inside every MPI rank, we had one MPI rank per node and 128 threads per rank. And so we're doing um, a lot of, of, we're doing MPI-based parallelization and threading ourselves. And we use our tools to analyze our, our execution time. And we were able to analyze the 64K profiles in 184 seconds. And so what you can see is that we're using our tools to understand all these blue regions are like, synchronization where we're waiting for one thread to finish something before we move to the next phase. And so this is the kind of thing that you'll see when you're looking at some of the examples that there are these phases where you spend time waiting for someone to complete and then there's a synchronization and then you move to a second phase. And so you'll you'll be doing the same kind of analysis that, that we did of our own tool, of, of looking at our own tools execution, you'll be looking at your application executions in the same way. So then finally, um, a couple of comments about some status and, and ongoing work. So for today, our focus is on in, in, in NVIDIA GPUs where we're measuring using the CUPD interface. We get fine grain measurement support with PC sampling. We get tracing support with CUPD. And then we do binary analysis of loops and inline code using information from NVDIS-ASM. So this is NVIDIA's disassembler. We asked them for an API and they refused to give us one. Um, because they saw it as outside the scope of their contract. And so we end up running this NVDIS ASM tool to dump text files and then parsing them ourselves to do binary analysis of the, uh, of the assembly code and the control flow um, with uh, using the Dynas performance tools. Um, Intel has their own story. They're, they have uh, um, OpenCL and level zero runtimes. They don't, do not have like a, a layer like Cupy. Instead, there's callbacks as, as kernels are launched and, and completed inside OpenCL and level zero. Um, we're using instrumentation to collect the measurement data. And uh, then we're using this uh, Intel graphics assembler as an API for cracking machine instructions and we use Dynas for analysis. And AMD has a similar story to NVIDIA where they have a tool that's uh, called Rock Tracer, which is quite like, or a, a tool layer called Rock Tracer. That's quite like the copy layer. Um, it, it provides support for, um, for measuring kernel executions and we, one can build traces off that. And we've, uh, we've been working with the University of Wisconsin to uh, build some support for um, instrumentation of AMD GPUs like um, Intel's PIN or GT PIN for their GPU um, instrumentation. We've been working with the Diamonds team to build some instrumentation tools for uh, for measuring GPU execution. And then, um, and then also we've been working with the Diamonds team on building um, an instruction decoder that will enable us to do binary analysis. So we already are able to do preliminary analysis of AMD binaries. And so the, the ongoing work is uh, to improve the support for indirect control flow, like switch statements and indirect branches and, and whatnot. So um, I wanna make the, the comment here that, uh, that the kind of detailed performance analysis that we're trying to do where we're coming up with um, costs that we're attributing to every GPU machine instruction, this requires a lot of support across the entire software stack. So um, the hardware has to have support for fine grain measurement and attribution. And so this is the responsibility of the, the GPU vendors. And so NVIDIA's PC sampling um, approximately meets our, our needs. So then there's uh, support for appropriate user interfaces for introspection and analysis. So Linux perf events interface, uh, the dynamic loader, so that we can track shared libraries provides us LD audit interface. 
Um, we've been working with Red Hat on uh, on LD Audit, and then Elf Utils is something that uh, enables us to gather data out of binaries and look at line maps. And so there's some extensions that are needed to to uh, deal with the binaries from CUDA 11.2. And so we've been working with Red Hat on those. There's uh, also the, the GPU vendor software stacks for uh, for controlling. So be, beyond just the hardware support, there's uh, things like Cupti uh, that has uh, interactions with the kernel driver and the runtime and our tooling API. And so we've been working with uh, the, the, the GPU vendors to to refine their definitions of these uh, APIs to better support tools. Also, if we're going to get good um, attribution of fine-grained performance measurements, we need high-quality dwarf information from the compilers. And so we've been working with the vendors and the, the LLVM community in order to uh, make sure that each machine instruction is associated with full call chains. On inside the, the runtime, we need the runtime to maintain information and map computations back to the source view. So um, we're working with the OpenMP Standards Committee. In fact, I was involved in, um, in leading the definition of the effort to define the OpenMP tools interface that was finally made available in OpenMP5 and the implementations of that are still um, a work in progress. And then finally, the performance tools have to gather the measurements using sampling and uh, callbacks and uh, reading event streams and map them back to source. And so we attribute things precisely whenever that's possible. And um, in the cases where we have flat PC samples on, on uh, in the GPUs, then we want to attribute things to GPU calling context and loops in the, the GPU code. And um, also using program slicing to attribute inefficiencies from where they observe back to their causes. So for instance, we might have an, a machine instruction like an add on a GPU that's adding a value um, from a couple of registers. Well, we might see that there's a memory stall in this add instruction. It isn't the add instruction that itself that's causing the stall. The add instruction is where the stall is observed. The stall is a result of some load that hasn't completed yet. And so we try to trace back through the control flow to find out where, where the loads were that were causing the stalls. And so, uh, so Karen has built a, a tool, uh, Karen and, and Zhao Zhu on my team have built a, a tool called uh, GPA that uh, traces these costs back to their, their causes. And so we're using uh, the University of Wisconsin's Dynas, um, performance, uh, sorry, binary analysis infrastructure as the, the framework for, for building these kinds of tools. So what I wanted to give you a, a sense of is just that there's a lot of moving parts in here. And so if something doesn't work out exactly the way that you would like with one of your applications, it's possible that it's not our, our, it's not our tool's fault. It may be a fault of something inside the OpenMP implementation or some issue with the, uh, the CUPTI measurement infrastructure, or certainly we found that there are, are issues with uh, with glibc, there's some some bugs in the dynamic loader and and whatnot, and so any of these things can affect um, the usability of our tool. So some briefly some ongoing work. Um, I mentioned this uh, GPU performance advisor tool for NVIDIA GPUs. So this is uh, something that's available on on GitHub. So this is actually sort of an extended version of HPC Toolkit that uh, attributes it analyzes instruction stalls and it uses backward slicing to to figure out where the stalls came from, and it offers some advice about how to uh, how to fix performance problems in your code. And um, we're we're also uh, Lexano is going to tell you about this uh, integrated interface for looking at profiles and traces. And we've been building some some work on identifying um, serialization in both CPU and GPU traces, and that's not in the version that's released on the clusters yet. Another thing that's work in progress is collecting um, GPU performance counter measurements to support roofline analysis. So this is, if you don't know something about roofline analysis, you probably want to. So this is a way of understanding how close you are to the maximum possible performance um, that you could achieve with your code. So this is a way to know that your tuning is done. Um, and so it's very useful for assessing how well you're doing relative to what your program is trying to accomplish. Um, so we expect to have support for that um, eventually inside HPC Toolkit. Right now, you can do this inside uh, VTune or um, or Insight. Um, we uh, we're updating HPC Toolkit to use the new um, 
CUDA 11.2, which has, um, so it has more information about inlining and there's an emerging version of, of Cuppy that has uh, lower overhead. Uh, can't say much about that, but just uh, look forward to uh, improvements in, in the future. And uh, we're also working on um, improving the scalability of our measurement analysis, uh, improving the measurement on AMD and Intel GPUs, and also improving things so that you can support um, analysis of machine learning frameworks that are based on, on Python. So um, finally, I'd like to make a, a few final remarks. So it's nice to work with uh, national labs and have early involvement in the big procurements. Um, it, it amplifies our ability to affect the vendor hardware and software in the near term. So um, I mentioned that we're dissatisfied with uh, NVDIS ASM as a way of getting information about NVIDIA GPU binaries. Well, NERSC has not signed their final check on Perlmutter yet. And so they still have some leverage. So maybe they can work with us to request some things from NVIDIA. So, um, the, so, so being involved in these national lab procurements means that we can get some of the things that, that we need in order to build better tools. And it's not just something that we need, it's if anyone's trying to build tools with these capabilities, they need certain features. And so having some leverage always helps to get these things. One problem though, is if we're not involved in the procurement too early, then a statement of work can get written that doesn't have anything about providing say, um, an API to crack machine instructions on NVIDIA GPUs. And so that's what happened with the, the Coral One project where um, Summit and Sierra got delivered and we didn't get the API we wanted. I asked for it, but contracts had already been signed before I asked, and so nothing happened. NVIDIA is now recognizing that maybe they ought to try and meet some of the needs of the community a little better. Um, so, and then finally, I just comment that the, the software development challenges for building a set of tools that understand all of these things at the lowest possible level is pretty challenging. And that my team is currently working on building um, tools for three different GPU software stacks for NVIDIA, Intel, and AMD GPUs. And that's kind of, that's just ridiculous. We're very under-resourced for, for doing this. I could use a team that's like three times the size. Um, we're also working on building capabilities ahead of what the vendor hardware and software are capable of. And, um, and we're, we're waiting for the, the hardware to catch up. We understand some of what's coming and some new features that are coming. And so that's, we're actively working on that. The software stacks for AMD and Intel are kind of a work in progress at this point. And uh, as I mentioned, relying on these vendor close uh, source components is a challenge that um, the standards like even say, uh, you know, the, the Cup to API, it, it tells us like, you know, here are the things that you can call, but it doesn't say anything about, oh, by the way, we're creating threads behind the scenes and we're creating lots of them. And so as a tool that measures thread creation and whatnot, we kind of need to know what's happening inside or experimentally we determine what's happening inside and say, oh, Kudor uh, Cupti is creating lots of threads um, just for measuring and so, we shouldn't measure the threads that they're creating for measuring. And so that leads to kind of some exploratory development inside our tools that just makes it a little bit more difficult. Okay, so that's, that's what I wanted to say as sort of like a high level overview of what we're doing and why we're doing it. And then um, Laxano and Karen are gonna talk about the details of actually using these tools to uh, look at some examples. So I'd be happy to take a couple of questions and then probably a break is in order. Thanks, uh, John. Anyone have any questions? You can unmute yourself and speak. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Can you elaborate on the workflow? So the workflow pretty much well, you'll, you'll see this from, from Karen in detail, but generally what you, what you do here is you will, you will compile your application, you'll launch it with HPC run, which collects some measurements. And then while it's running, you can, you can analyze your, um, your CPU binary with HPC struct. Um, as it runs, uh, your application may be actually jitting some GPU binaries. And so after, the application is run, then you use uh, HPC struct to analyze the, the GPU binaries that are created. And so Karen's gonna cover that in detail. So in general, you say HPC run, and then HPC struct to analyze some machine code, 
and then you use HPC crop to combine the measurements, and then um, that will produce data that you then look at with the user interface. Okay, and so the details of exactly how to do that will become clear when when um, Karen shows you what that is, and then actually the tutorial examples all have this stuff automated. So we have a, a set of examples where you should be able to say, make build, make run. And um, if you're not on summit, then you can say, make view. And, and so the, the build part is going to compile your application. And so on summit, you're going to compile it on the login node on core, you're going to combine it on, you're going to compile on the backend nodes and we'll, we'll do an S batch to automate uh, offloading the compilation onto the, the, uh, the GPU nodes. HPC run gets, gets run on, uh, on a compute node. HPC struct can be run either on a head node or on a compute node. HPC prof can be run on a login node. HPC prof MPI, um, this is a parallel program. And so this would get run on a compute node. And on Cori, you can analyze the data on a head node. On Summit, the warning is, please don't. You might crash the machine. So just to clarify, the one that needs to be inside the batch job would be just the HPC run. HPC struct oh. and HPC prof MPI can be run on the head node. So it's you not necessarily. Um, yeah, so on, on for, for the, the workshop, the way things are organized is um, the software stack on the Cori login nodes is completely different than the software stack on the GPU nodes. And so one way that you can deal with that is you can log into one of the GPU nodes and you can build your code back there. For the examples that we've, that we've put together on the login node, you can say make build. And then what it's actually gonna do is it's gonna launch a batch job that's gonna do the build on the backend nodes on Cori, okay? Because they have different compilers and they're running a different version of the operating system. So on Cori, we're doing the build on the compute nodes as well. So basically for Cori, all of this is occurring on the compute nodes. On Summit, this occurs on the login nodes, this occurs on a compute node, and then we also do the analysis, the HPC struct and HPC prof. We're doing it on a compute node again out of convenience. Okay. How much resources would the analysis um, routines take, the HPC struct and HPC prof? Would it be considerable amount of time so it, it depends upon the size of, of your binary. So um, we've seen binaries as, as big as, as seven gigabytes, okay? And so if you're analyzing seven gigabytes, you probably don't wanna do it on a login node and H, actually HPC struct supports multiple threads. So if you log into a compute node, you can say HPC struct dash J16 or something and use 16 threads to analyze a large binary. So if you're analyzing really large binaries, doing it on a compute node and using parallelism is preferable. Um, for analyzing GPU binaries, as I mentioned, we're using NVDISASM to do that. And so if you're doing sort of surface level analysis, just to map back to line information, then um, that's reasonably fast. If you're actually trying to analyze the control flow in the, NV in the NVIDIA's GPU binaries, that can be very expensive. And so doing that for one GPU binary might take as much as 30 minutes or so, okay? And so if you're running that long, you might not wanna do that on a, on a login node either. And so um, you'll, you'll get a feel for this as you start working with some of the examples or trying it on your own code, okay? I'm interested in Julia, a Thanks. dynamic language. What would be involved in supporting JIT compiled code? It uses LLVM or JIT. So the, the main issue, so LLVM, I think will actually do a good job carrying information through um, about the mapping between the, uh, the machine code and the source lines that it came from. So if we, so the main thing is in order to know what that mapping is, we actually have to capture the JIT compiled output. So if what they actually produce is something like an ELF binary, then 
if we can capture it, then we could analyze it. So I haven't actually done anything with, with Julia. So I, I don't know exactly what some of the internal details are inside their runtime system. Okay. So what I can tell you from the high level is we probably have to do at least something. We have to capture these JIT compiled binaries. So if they're not already captured, then we would have to capture them. But beyond that, we might be able to just use the rest of it without very much changes. Okay, thank you. John, I have a question about the over-provisioning of the resources. Uh, so if we uh, over-provision resources with some few extra cores, do we need to take care of the pinning of these things or we just keep them idle and HPC toolkit is going to figure out these are extra cores and will pin the its internal thread to these cores? Um, that's a that's a good question. I, I think if you just use some extra cores, then then using um, using say JS run or S run, that the problem will probably take care of itself. Okay, when the extra threads get created, they'll get created on other cores. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, and I don't have it, so I don't have any specific advice to offer you about that. Okay, thank you. And second question is about uh, the overhead. So HPC Toolkit is nice because it has a typically low overhead depending upon sampling frequency, of course. How this changes with the GPU profiling support and let's say, especially if we are using more MPI ranks than total GPUs available, for example, with something like CUDA MPS service, uh, how this profiling overhead, uh, especially compared to the CPU profiling. Okay, so there, there's two comments about that. One is if you are using more MPI ranks than GPUs, then you can't actually use the PC sampling capability. That is a limitation of NVIDIA's Cupfi stack. Okay, if you want to do PC sampling, then you have to have only one MPI rank per GPU. I understand that that's, that's not a way that lots of application developers write their code, but you might be able to run some small scale experiments that are, uh, that are just using one GPU per rank in order to collect some data to find out some, some details about how you're spending your time. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, other than that, with multiple MPI ranks per GPU, things work out okay. I don't really have experience using MPS, but I have used multiple MPI ranks with a with a, a GPU without MPS, and that works just fine for like the, the coarse grain kernel level profiling. So then you asked about cost. So um, I think that the the cost is roughly a factor of two when running one of these, uh, the GPU accelerated applications. And so uh, that's on par with uh, what NVIDIA's NVProf was mm -hmm. using. So it's much less expensive than NVIDIA's Insight Compute. Okay. But so still on the order of uh, around a, a factor of two for just the kernel level profiling and then for the PC sampling, it can be more, and that's something that we're working with NVIDIA on. And so I would expect some improvements on that in the future, okay? If I understood correctly, you said 2X compared to the CPU profiling, is it? Uh, 2X in, in total runtime. Okay. Okay, so, and, and unfortunately, most of that overhead <laughs> is, is not ours. And so it, it's like a, a function of NVIDIA's Cupti measurement infrastructure at the moment. And so um, there's, there's a, we can only reduce it so much because a lot of it is inside the measurement library. That's, but that's changing. Okay. Thank sorry, you. To, sorry to ask this. So you, you're, you're saying that NVProf was actually less overhead than NVSYS, the new way of doing things? Uh, than then Insight Compute. Insight Compute, well, yeah, sorry. Okay, and, I realized. Compute, okay, Insight Compute is is doing PC sampling, but this may do as much as like you know ten passes over a code, and we're just doing one pass with PC sampling. Okay. So we we get much of the same information, but with less cost. Okay. 
Well, that's because they do replay more kernels, essentially. That that's correct. There are other ways where we can where we can collect information. So, um, Karen will will talk about this a little bit, I think. But we can compute utilization by just saying so. We're using samples, and this is how many samples we expected based on the clock frequency. This is how many samples we got. And so, if we get less samples than we expected, then we can infer that the SMs were idle because they weren't collecting samples. And so then we can get approximate information about SM utilization by looking at sort of samples expected versus samples actually recorded without actually measuring directly. And it turns out that these measurements, that the approximations are actually pretty useful and pretty accurate. So you don't need to do any replays at all or you do just less replays? Um, so, if we're just using PC sampling, then um, we don't actually do any replays. Right. Um, Karen will say a, a little bit about this, but for, for uh, this GPA tool, we actually use uh, replays a little bit by just using some, some CUPTI events that uh, will collect some additional measurements using instrumentation. And that will do some replays. Mm -hmm. and, and you expect to use the same uh, general philosophy for the tools for uh, uh, rock and once they're actually available? Uh, that's right. So we actually have something that's operational at present, but we don't have any support for fine grain measurement. We only have kernel level measurement. Mm -hmm. And so um, a few weeks ago, that was working great. And then they released a couple of release candidates for rock and for one and they you know, broke our software stack and broke people's applications. And so um, does it work? Well, like it worked on Rockham 4.0. It's not working on Rockham 4.1 yet, and we're waiting for 4.1 to, to stabilize. So they have a new release of 4.1 out. We haven't installed it yet. We don't know. But in general, it's like pretty much working. Okay. HBC Toolkit is pretty much working on Rockham when Rockham is working. So if one were to basically check it out and build it uh, for Rockham, it should just build for Rockham 4.0 if that's what one has installed. If if it's if it's installed for if you have Rockham 4.0 installed, then yes, you can build it for Rockham 4.0. Now I'll caution you that there's uh, the build instructions for Rockham are a little bit more complicated. So all of the the build we do is with spec and. Um, my colleague Mark is responsible for all of our support with SPAC. And so he is available. If you're trying to install with Rockham, um, he could assist you with that. But um, the Rockham build, it's not as easy as saying SPAC install HPC toolkit plus Rockham. That doesn't work yet because uh, AMD has to fix some of their packages. So you actually have to build a packages.yaml file that says, here's where Rockham is installed. Don't expect to build it with SPAC. And as long as you do that, then you can do a spec install of HPC toolkit with a pre-installed rocket. Okay. Thank you.